Hello, everyone. I am Rivka Malka Perlman of DavinForAFriend.com. If you are part of this program, welcome, welcome. We are beginning a worldwide movement of prayer groups, tefillah groups of people who daven for each other. And there is no doubt in my mind that you are creating a massive impact. If you're hearing this video on a different platform, you're welcome to go to davenforafriend.com, which is um, which you will learn about when you are at the site. In the meantime, this is the first in our weekly series of videos during these times and in connected with the effort to daven for a friend. So I often talk about receiving Hashem's love, that the work of humanity, the, the, the foundational work is for us to receive Hashem's love. It's one thing for somebody to love you. It's a whole nother ballpark when you get to actually feel that love, live in that love, experience life's happenings and painful moments through that love, really, really understanding that you are beloved. But today, I'm taking it to the next step because it is not enough to know that you are beloved. You must also know that you are worthy. I'll tell you what, Friday night in our home before Kiddush, we're all standing around the table and my husband stands up and he thanks each of the children. And very often he'll say a specific job that they did, sometimes by name, sometimes in general, and if you are that child and you have worked very hard that day, you feel amazing. And I know this because my father, he should be well and blessed. He did the same thing. He would stand up at the beginning of the meal and thank everyone. So here are our children. They're standing around. They're receiving this thank you. This thank you. And some of them are feeling amazing. Now, what if you're a child who didn't do that much? And your father says, thank you everyone for helping. You've all contributed. We couldn't have done it without you. Some of you washed dishes, some of you folded laundry. What a team you are. How do you feel if you haven't really done so much? Well, you don't feel so great, but it's okay because you make a joke about it, right about then. You kind of pass over that inner shame and make a joke about how much you help in the house. But the truth is you don't feel great. In order to feel worthy, there needs to be um, accomplishment. We need to have been living up to our highest potential. And then when someone outside of us affirms our worthiness, we feel amazing. I remember one summer, my parents did not think it was going to be a good idea for this particular teenager to go working in upstate New York with all of that freedom. And so my mother, unbelievably got me a job volunteering at a nursing home, the very nursing home that my grandmother was in. I must have been in ninth or 10th grade, I think 10th grade. And the job was to help out the occupational therapist. And so I would help elderly people learn how to tie their shoes with contraptions because it was difficult for them to bend down and difficult for their fingers to tie the knots and all kinds of things like that. Afterwards, I would take a city bus home or sometimes walk, and it was, it was a nice walk. It was a good two-mile walk. And I'll tell you what, that was not a summer of thrills. It really wasn't. It did not involve friends or escapades. There was no parties, but it built me. It really built something inside of me. And I remember actually the feeling of walking home on a hot summer's day Feeling the worthiness in me it was like a new feeling. I wasn't being um, pampered and, and spoiled and handed things. I was working. I was learning about my own worthiness. Well, Hashem, God, He loves us so much that He does not want us to be passive receivers of His love. He did not just create a world so he could pour into us and we would only just be receivers. No. His love is so 
massive, so sophisticated, so all encompassing to our every need, our every wish, our every corner of our heart and all of our entire well being that he put into creation the opportunity for us to rise into our worthiness and to partner with him. So as a, as a people, as a, as a Jewish people and the world at large, we are becoming aware of something called emuna, faith, absolute belief, truth, fact, that everything that Hashem does is for our benefit that he's watching over us, that he's got it covered. And this idea, this consciousness of God's presence has really been spreading in waves and waves and waves in an unbelievable way. I believe it's just my feeling that right now there is a second opportunity. And the second opportunity is not just to be aware of having faith in God, but to be aware of God's faith in us. The truth is, this was always the plan. It was always Hashem's plan that he would make mankind and mankind would do this unbelievable job of making this world a place where holiness could dwell. Our physical world is the lowest realm. There's the higher up worlds and then there's the physical world, which looks godless. Uh, it's run by nature, there is evil, that looks like a void, a place where God isn't, and somehow humanity would follow God's instruction, and we would find God and expose the godliness in every single thing we do. But we have lost our way, and we know that we can admit it in a very gentle way, that what has eating become, what has sleeping become, how, have we, how do we spend our time? Are we using all of these things to truly expose our godliness and godliness in the world? Or are we doing these things in a way that um, puts God maybe on the side? That is something to look at, perhaps for another day. I believe it's very, very worthy to look at just our human behavior. But for today, I want to focus on something, on a place where it should be easy to find God. And yet, even in this place, we have somewhat lost our way, okay? And that place is prayer. Prayer, by its very definition, is so holy. It's so spiritual. It's something that um, you can't use the word pray without using the word God. It just comes together. But somehow, prayer has become something that we have to do, something that's a chore, something that uh, maybe it feels out of reach or we feel out of touch with it. And it seems like that's one of those spiritual activities and here's my life, life and prayer, two separate things. And this very thing that was meant to open us up to our belovedness and our worthiness, which we will talk about soon, how the mechanism works. This very thing has become also a place where we have lost our way. And I want to spend some time today talking about how we can find our way back into prayer. Because to find your way back into prayer is to find your way back both into belovedness and into worthiness. I want to share with you one of my role models in prayer. My mother. My mother is very careful with her language because you see how you speak affects how you think and how you think affects how you feel. And so my mother would always be very careful never to say, I have to daven as if it's time to pray, I have to go pray. Mm -mm. She would say, I get to daven. And if she felt harried and things were in a rush and there was so much to do and out of her mouth would slip, but I have to go daven, she would stop herself and say, I mean, I get to daven. 
I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my mother and her davening and her praying because it's an image of what we can do, what we can be, what we can strive for in such a practical way. Many years ago, um, my brother Gabriel, Alev Hashalom, did something so beautiful. My parents were going to South Africa where he lived and he wanted to do something special for my father. And my father's relationship with davening is very, very serious. He shows up no matter what. And he is careful with the words and it means so much to him. And so my brother, who was not a carpenter, not a woodworker, none of that, did something that was an act of love. He made my father a stender, which is something, oh, the English word, a podium. Yes, a podium, which is something that you can lean on during prayer. If you're standing up and praying, you can put your sitter, you can put your prayer book on it and just the book is very, very close to you and you can look into it and oftentimes, you know, concentrate like this, shaking back and forth. And so when my father went to South Africa, it was going to be Yom Kippur. And so my brother hand made this stender for him. Shellacked it, cut it, everything. Big, beautiful, handsome stender. When my brother passed away, tragically at the age of 28, my parents arranged that this stender would be brought back to America for their use. And it sits there, I should say stands there, in the corner of my living room back home in Cleveland, Ohio. And while they both use it, my mother has made it her own in a very unique way. I don't know when this began and I really must ask her, but she began somewhere, somewhere could it be 20 years ago, to use her sitter in such a way that it was like, a, that it remains and is now like a, a study, a study of prayer. And if you see her sitter, you will see, that's her prayer book, you will see that she's highlighted certain words and underlined certain words and asked herself little questions, little introspective questions. Do I really care about this? Reminding herself to care about that, which is written in the book. If it says, Yerushalayim, and Jerusalem should be rebuilt, she would write something like, how much do I care? Really checking in with herself. This is God's top priority. Is it my priority? I remember uh, going home once, spending some time there and reading the paragraph that is Elokai Neshama, that's a little prayer in the morning that we say about my soul that you've placed within me, you have created it and you breathe life, life into it and it is pure. And she underlined or highlighted the words Tehorahi, it is pure. And I just sat on those words. You know, you can get coached on the healing of shame for hours and hours and hours and hours, or you can sit with your sitter and meditate on the truth of the words, Elokai Neshama Shinasata Bi Tehorahi. God, the soul that you placed within me, she is pure. Just sit on that line for a long time. That soul is pure. And then a line later on, and one day you will take that soul from me. Another point of contemplation. What do I do with this soul that you've given me, this unbelievable gift? What kind of shape do I want it to be in when I return her to you? Another question to ask. You can, you can look and introspect on your entire life just from that one tefillah, that one prayer, if you want. If you put the effort into it. And what's so adorable, um, that might be the wrong word, what is so heartwarming is how my father has joined her in this avoda, in this service. You can see his touches in the quotes that he wrote, his very nice handwriting. And if she likes a quote and it inspires her, he'll write it for her and stick it up on the wall so she can look at it in her special davening place. And there's a lamp that he's clipped onto the stender as to make it easier for her to see because the light is shining right on the words. And at some point she got a larger print sitter because that also would make it easy for her. 
And while I always grew up seeing my father make prayer a priority, it is very, very interesting for me to witness my mother's growth in prayer because when I was growing up, her main job was not to stand with a prayer book. Her main job was to take care of us and she did that so beautifully. So this wave, this, this maturing of spirituality in a different way was something that I got to watch and learn from and watch and learn from. And it taught me that it is never too late to impact your children and your family, which can teach us right now it is not too late. However you have been praying or not praying, with intention, without intention, all of that, your family has been absorbing and it is not too late to teach them something else through your actions, to stand taller, to be more worthy in prayer, to take in this avoda in a much more um, proactive way it's not too late and your family is going to learn and benefit from it. Families are home right now. They're watching. It used to be that the children were off at school while you did whatever adult thing you do. Now is the time where we craft our days. What do we want our time to look like? Who is the woman that I want my child to see? Who is the man that I want my child to see? Because they are taking notes. It's fascinating. It is fascinating for children to see the insides of their parents' workings. When your children are home with you, they're getting to see you up close in a new way. What matters to you? How incredible is that? And so even if you are at a stage in your life where you do not have time to stand still in prayer, how you talk to Hashem to God throughout the day, thanking him, asking him, praising him, noticing him. They're watching, they're learning. And every time you eat and make a blessing, they're watching, they're learning. Not only that, Hashem himself, who has invited us to be partners in creation, he is watching, he is learning. Who are my children? Who is this daughter? I have slowed down all of time so that my children can recalibrate throughout the world because they are human and they have lost track as human beings will do. And for thousands of years, Hashem has been hoping and waiting and hoping and waiting that we would make a world in which his presence would be felt everywhere. Like it says, Shibisi Hashem Lenegdi Samid. I place God before me always. And when it became too difficult for us, when too many things were getting off track, so that even prayer has become a chore, God forbid, Hashem is taking the time now to recalibrate us, to bring the entire world to a standstill so that we have the opportunity to rise and to become the true partners in creation that we were always meant to be. Because ultimately what Hashem wants is a world that is filled with his consciousness. When you are filled with God consciousness, you are floating with divinity. You are more than okay. You have purpose, worth, mission, love. Everything begins to make sense. Everything is united. There is not prayer and life. Life is prayer. It is all service. And all of you is seen, loved, accepted, welcomed. So now we are here and the world needs our prayers. Everywhere we look, People are sick, people are dying, people are alone, people are scared. And for those who haven't been fully, fully touched and affected and are only simply quarantined, people are having a chance to dig deeper, to recalibrate, to become who they were always meant to be. And Hashem is truthfully giving each of us a different experience of what this time is. 
For some, it is bringing unbelievable suffering. For some, it is bringing unbelievable contentment. For some, it's the first time they've had to truly face themselves alone. Whatever it is, it is the recipe that Hashem knows that we need. And prayer is one of the greatest ways to bring healing both to your own heart and to the world. That's the recipe. So if we think all of this is happening and it's just happening at us and we are just the passive receivers of God's plan, we will have missed the point. Hashem has slowed things down so that we can get our act together, so to speak. Those are rough words, but I say them gently because he's saying them to us with love. Please, dears, please come get your act together. There's so much for you to do. There's so much that you can be. Your prayers will connect you to me and will bring down healing. Come, come, focus inwards. Don't make this something you have to do. Make this something you get to do. In order to do this, in order to really start deepening our relationship with prayer, we have to understand two things. And these are the two things that I want to end off with. One is why prayer is important. And we're going to do that kind of short. Just we mentioned that we'll talk about the mechanism. And two is the two is a practical way that you can strengthen your connection with prayer, even if prayer is foreign even if davening seems hard, even if God feels distant to you, even if you never pray. Now is your time. So let's do this real quick. Step one, the mechanism. What is prayer? The mother bird is completely devoted to her babies. From the moment that she hatches those eggs, she is sitting on them. When she needs to go off, the male bird comes and sits on them. Those eggs are not left alone for a moment. They are kept warm. They are kept protected. And when those little baby birds hatch, what do they do? They open their mouths wide and they stick their necks up and they say, feed us, feed us, in their little chirping voices. And this tells the mother bird, it's time for me to go get food. And she goes and she, she gets those worms and she chews them up and she gives them to the baby. And she goes back and forth giving her little baby birds food as many times as they need it. She doesn't stop until they are content. They chirp, she responds. They chirp, she responds. It is the most beautiful and unbelievable thing if you've ever seen it. The complete vulnerability and dependence of these little baby birds and the complete devotion of the mother bird. One aspect of prayer, just one, there's so much to talk about and we'll talk about it in future classes. One aspect of prayer is that our turning to Hashem is like that little baby bird opening its beak saying, feed me, feed me. And there is nothing in the world that, that that mother bird wants to do more than to feed her children. That is her singular focus. When we open up to Hashem, we bring down a shower of mercy. We literally bring it down by saying, we need you. He's left. I'm here for you. I got you. And he feeds us and we are content. Now you may say to me, wait a minute. I've prayed for a lot of things and I have not gotten answers, so to speak. And so we make a delineation. There is the filling up of Hashem himself that literally brings us to fullness. Like you've had a delicious meal and your stomach is full that you get from investing in prayer. Then there's also the physical, tangible results. The physical, tangible results of prayer come down in different ways. No prayer is wasted. But Hashem will only give you what is good for you and when it is good for you. Your prayer will always result in being answered. You are answered in the moment by the filling up of Hashem. 
And not only that, but he's storing it up to bring you the greatest blessing in your life. The greatest blessing in your life may look a little different than what you thought it looked like. Sometimes it looks exactly the same, but later on when you're more ready to receive it. We can talk about that another time because it's fascinating, fascinating to be able to look at life and to realize we do get what we long for. We really truly do, but only when we're ready for it. So in talking about the mechanism of prayer, like I said, there's so much to talk about, but I just want to leave you with that image that you're just coming to Hashem like a baby bird, opening its mouth up, and that evokes this unbelievable response. Okay, step two, how? What can we do right now to invest more deeply in prayer? Here are a few ideas. One idea, especially now because we're all at home, is to create a special place. I'm actually coming to you from my special place right now. This is my office some decorations that I hung up. Each one is symbolic to me. There's other things around here. This is where I come to Davin. Special places create a kind of sacredness. Like my mother's, my mother's fender. Ooh, fender. You go there and you're in your zone. Could it be that there is a corner of your house that you can make your own? I have friends that have decorated their space with a quote that they like or a picture that just evokes something in them. Can you do that? The physical, tangible things that we do really, really help us to, to support our emotional and spiritual world. So think about, can I do that? And I remember a friend who had a room in her house that was such a mess, and she decided, I'm going to use this room for my davening room. And she thought she'd have to figure it out on her own. It was so beautiful. Her husband helped her to clear it out, and she just invested in making it her own and a place where she goes every day to daven. So that's idea number one. Can you make a place? Idea number two, and this is something that I do, which is before heading into any formal prayer with the sitter or prayer book, I talk to Hashem in my own words. I talk to God in my own words, and I begin this dialogue, and it's almost like a warm-up exercise. Like it says, Ashrei Yoshrei Vesecha, Odi Halu Chasela, that's one of, a, a quote from Tehillim from Psalms. And uh, the, the commentaries on that verse say that the Hasidim, the, the ones who want to serve Hashem with, in, in, with an extra way, they would sit in contemplation for an hour before prayer. Perhaps before Corona, that would seem very, very um, surprising and amazing. How would anyone sit anywhere for an hour? But we're learning. We are learning to slow down. And what could matter more? So I'm not saying to sit for an hour, but two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, if it moves you, 10 minutes, to talk to Hashem in your own words and to start to move your heart in the direction of prayer so that when you open up that book, it's not just saying someone else's words. You are ready to pour into the words and to let the words speak to you, just as my mother would let the words of the sitter speak to her. But you've got to prepare the heart space. So that's another idea. Prepare yourself for a few minutes first. Another way of preparing yourself is to listen to a song. There are some unbelievable songs out there. So beautiful. And your song might change or you might have a special song that when you listen to that song, it just gets you in the zone. It's your happening song. It's your prayer song. And um, that is one idea that really can be beautiful. I, I remember doing that for a while. I would walk around with my headphones um, and just get into the zone and then put them down and go right into the Shemona Esrei. That, that was my practice at some point. So that is another idea. Finally, one more idea. If you cannot stand in prayer or if it's just simply not your life space or you're just not used to this, begin by having more intention in your blessings. We say blessings every time we eat. We say blessings every time we use the restroom. Those are beautiful times to slow down for about 30 seconds and to realize with intention, I'm speaking to God. Yeah, that one who just fed me food like a baby bird. I had raisins in my yogurt this morning. Guess what? I cannot create a raisin. 
There is one who created that raisin and who arranged for it to be brought literally into my hands and into my mouth, feeding me just like that mother bird feeds her little babies. When I say a blessing on that, I'm acknowledging that I can take my time. And now that I'm home with the children, I always take a pause and I say, please, could you say amen? Because every time you say a blessing, it brings down this shower of love, the shower of blessing from Hashem. And every time you say amen, it's like you catch it. You catch a blessing, you create a vessel for it. Well, I definitely would like my house to be filled with blessings. So I say a bracha. I ask everyone to say amen. I want to slow down and to focus in. Because one of my very favorite lines is, the quieter you are, the more you can hear. And we are having an opportunity for unprecedented quiet. And so the next time that you say a bracha, you say a blessing, perhaps even if no one's around, or maybe when you're doing a quiet davening and you say one of the blessings in Shmona Esther with particular intention, you can feel and you can think that Hashem himself is saying amen. Amen to you, my dear. You are not only being a passive receiver of my love, you are coming forward and investing of yourself in this relationship. And for that, I commend you because you are worthy. And what I want for you is to stand taller, to invest more, to slow down, to work harder, to be the person that I created you to be. Thank you.